Welcome. In this video, we'll be going over a review of frequency response, and in particular, how frequency response uh, relates to circuits. Let's get started. So we'd like to be able to define a frequency response. First off, what is the type of system that we can look at the frequency response? Well, it should be a linear time invariant system, or an LTI system. So consider the case shown here, where we have a system, we have an input u of t, and there's an output y of t. And we'll say that this is a linear time invariant system. What does a linear time invariant system mean? Well, if the system is linear, if an o, sorry, if the system is linear, if u1 results in an output of y1 of t, u2 of t results in an output y2 of t, then the system is linear if and only if u, an input of u1 of t plus u2 of t results in an output of y1 of t plus y2 of t. And that should be true for any u1 or u2. So that defines what a linear system is. What about being a time invariant system? So time invariant, a time invariant, a system is time invariant if and only if u1 of t results in an output y1 of t. If we delay that input, so we put an input in of u1 of t minus tau, that would result in an output of y1 t minus tau. So it'd be delayed the exact same amount. And that should be true for any y, any, sorry, any u of t and any tau. So if we meet both those, or, those criteria, then our system is linear time invariant. The next thing we need to look at is the impulse response for this system. So we'd like to say, what is the impulse response? We'll see this relates to the frequency response. So the impulse response, again, given a input u of t, a linear time invariant system. It has an output y of t. The input u of t could be voltage, could be current. The output could be voltage, could be current, could be charge, whatever. So now, we, if we assume that u of t is an impulse, by impulse here we mean a Dirac delta function, which can be shown to be, uh, or can be drawn with this symbol here, a small delta of t. What does that mean? A direct delta function is shown as this curve here. So it goes up, goes off to infinity, and then goes, goes to zero again. So it's zero for all time, except at time t equal to zero, and then it goes off to infinity. Going off to infinity though, the width of it is zero. So we actually, in a direct delta function, we find that the area of that impulse is one. In other words, if we integrated this curve here, which has an impulse that goes off to infinity, width of zero, so the width here is zero width. If we integrated this uh, curve, so the integral of this Dirac delta function would be shown as this, would be zero for up until time t equals zero, jump to one because we're integrating the air, the integration is the confining the area of this curve, delta of t, and then stays at one for all time after that. So this is the integral of u of t dt, one u of t is a uh, direct delta function, or an impulse. So when um, y of t is the output, when u of t is a impulse, um, then we say that y, y of t is the impulse response of our system. We often refer to that impulse response as h of t. So we often say that um, rather than using y of t, because y of t is going to change, if u of t changes, 
So often we say that h of t will be the impulse response of a system. Of course, we might use a different j of t or whatever, but in com it's common to use h of t, t. So h of t would be the output of the system whenever the input is an impulse response. So in other words, h of t is y of t when u of t is an impulse. Now in the case of an arbitrary u of t, so we don't have u of t being an impulse, but u of t is an arbitrary um, uh, function or values over time, then we can find that the output is given by u of t convolved with the impulse response for that system. Assume our system is a linear time invariant system. This, uh, this um, symbol right here is a convolution symbol. So the cross with a circle in it denotes convolution. Now, we're more interested in frequency response. So we, if we could deal with, we could do all of our analysis just using convolutions, but it would be very, very messy. So we'd like to know how our linear time invariant system behaves with sinusoidal inputs. And for that, we'll find the transfer function uh, h of s. So we find a transfer function h of s. Here, h of s will be the Laplace transform. So this L here is denoting the Laplace transform. So the Laplace transform of the impulse response, h of t. So we refer to h of s then as the transfer function of our system. Now, in the case where our system is made up of lumped elements, typically resistors, capacitors, inductors, transistors, etc., diodes, whatever, then H of S becomes, is always going to be a ratio of two polynomials in S. So h of s can always be written as a ratio of two polynomials. As an example, h of s is shown here, where it's equal to a ratio of two polynomials. The numerator is a, a second order polynomial in s. So a, a2 s squared plus a1 s plus a0, whereas the denominator is a third order polynomial in s, b b sub 3 s cubed plus b sub 2 s squared, etc. So we would always see h of s written as a ratio of two polynomials if we're dealing with lumped elements. That's not always going to be the case. In this course, that's only the case it will be dealing with, but you'll see in other electrical engineering cases, h of s will not be a ratio of polynomials. A typical example of that would be a transmission line or a distributed RC wire. So if we're looking at a wire that has an impedance, that's uh, an impedance along the wire, because the wire has resistance associated with it, it also has capacitance associated with it, and that's capacitance associated along the wire, then um, that would not be represented as a ratio of two polynomials. polynomials. So now that we've looked at the transfer function, what the um, definition of a transfer function is, we'd like to look at the frequency response for a system. So consider a case where we have a um, LTI system. In this case, we'll use T of S as representing the transfer function for this system, so rather than H of S. So we have a linear time, in time invariant system with a transfer function T of S. The frequency response is given by letting s equal j omega. Remember, t of s is a ratio of two polynomials in s. So we take s, we let that equal to j omega, where omega is the angular frequency 
in radians per second. So as an example, um, we have this example here, where if we had u of t was equal to ap, so that would be the amplitude of the sine wave, times sine of omega t. Now omega is also related to the frequency in hertz. We can write down that omega is equal to 2 pi f, where f is the frequency in cycles per second or hertz. So in this example, we can also write down that our input, u of t, is in so much radians per second, or we can write it also down as 2 pi f t, where f is the hertz, how many cycles per second the um, sine wave is at, or the sinusoidal signal. So as a, this example, we'll let omega equal 6.28 times 10 to the third radians per second. If we um, then change that into frequency, we know that f, by this equation here, f is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. So if we divide this by 2 pi, we see that the frequency for this will be 1 kilohertz. Since the frequency is 1 kilohertz, we know that the period is given by 1 over f. So the period in this case is 1 over 1,000, which is 1 millisecond. So we have a plot of our input sine wave shown here. Now, let's assume our output for this particular system looks like something like this. First off, you can show that the output will always be, for a linear time invariant system, if the input is a sine wave or sinusoidal wave, the output will also be a sinusoidal wave. And the only things that will be different will be that the output will have a different, potentially a different amplitude and potentially a different phase. The output, so an input um, signal into any linear time invariant system of a certain frequency, the output will also be at the same frequency, same uh, range per second, but it may change in amplitude and phase. So in this case here, we're showing that the amplitude now is A sub Q, where previously it was A sub P for the input. And the phase now is a phase of phi, where previously the phase was zero because there's no extra term added in there. So what we have is, as I mentioned, if the input is sinusoidal with frequency F, for a linear time invariant system, then the output will also be sinusoidal with the frequency f, but potentially different amplitude and phase. Could be the same amplitude and phase, but it could also be different. So what we find is that the ratio of the output amplitude to the input amplitude is given by the magnitude of t of j omega. Recall what I said is we let s equal j omega. So we had a polynomial in s, and now we let all the s's become j omega. And if we find the magnitude of this complex number, that will give us the uh, chain or the ratio of the output amplitude to the input amplitude, a sub q divided by uh, a sub p. If we look at the phase of this complex number, so because t of s is a ratio in polynomials, if we let s equal j omega, t of j omega just becomes a complex number. In fact, it becomes a ratio of two complex numbers, but we can still divide out those two complex numbers and get a single complex number. And we'll have a phase for this complex number, which I'm showing here as a left bracket, so a left angle bracket. And so that becomes the phase uh, response. That becomes the phase change between the input and the output. So as I mentioned, T of J omega, is just a complex number, and the magnitude of that complex number is the magnitude response, and the phase of that complex number is the phase response. So it would be useful then to review a little bit about complex numbers. So just a quick review of complex numbers and just finding magnitude and phase. Here is a um, complex plane where we have the real axis drawn in the horizontal, so this is the real axis here, 
and the imaginary axis is drawn in the vertical axis. So we have this J term here. So if we have a, a term A plus JB, the B term would show up on the vertical axis and the A term would show up on the horizontal axis. So in the case that, um, in this case, we have A is equal to one. So A is just this term, this point right here in the complex plane. The magnitude of A is just the distance of A of uh, this point to the origin, 0, 0. So in this case here, the magnitude of A is just equal to 1. The phase of this number is going to be the phase from the real axis. So in this case here, it's right along the real axis in the same direction here. So we have that the phase of this complex number will be 0 for A. So for this point, again, we're looking at this point right here, A equal to 1. Now if we look at the case B is equal to minus 1, so now we're looking at this case here. Then we have that the magnitude is still 1, but now our phase is 180 because we're going around from here to here 180 degrees, or pi. So the phase of uh, B being minus 1 has a, a phase of 180 degrees and a magnitude of 1. Similarly, you can find that for C, which is this point right here, we have its magnitude is still 1, but the phase is now 90 because the phase is this angle from the real axis up to um, the direction where this vector occurs. So we're finding the length of this vector and the uh, phase or the angle uh, relative to the real axis for that vector. And then we have uh, the case D here, which is at this point. In this case, uh, D is equal to... 1 plus j, and so the magnitude of that is going to be 1 squared plus 1 squared, and take the square root of it, so it's this distance from here to here, which will be 1 and 1, so the hypotenuse of this case, or I guess 1 down here, and um, we know that that distance here is going to be root 2. So the magnitude is equal to root 2, and the phase is going to be this angle here, which in this case the phase is now going to be 45 degrees. Now, so we can write uh, a complex number as z is equal to a plus jb. So z is complex, and we assume that a and b are both real numbers. So we have that the magnitude of z is just given by a squared plus b squared and take the square root of it, so just Pythagoras' theorem. We have that the phase of z is equal to the arctan of b over a if a is greater than 0. And it's given by b over a plus pi if a is less than 0. And you can go through this and see that these are all true. Now, what about the ratio of complex numbers? Because we know that our transfer function is going to be the ratio of two polynomials in S, and each, once we let S equal J omega, it'll be the ratio of two complex numbers. So if we say that Z is equal to Z1 divided by Z2, where Z1 is a complex number, given by this, and Z2 is a complex number, given by this. So um, a2 plus j times b2. We can write them in polar notation. So we can write um, z1 as the magnitude of z1 times e to the j times the phase of z1. And similarly, we can write z2 as the magnitude of z2 times e to the j times the phase of uh, z2. So if we take the ratio 
of the if we look at the magnitude of just z the original one it's the ratio of the magnitude of z1 relative to the magnitude of z2 in that case we can ignore this e to the j part because the magnitude of that so the magnitude of this is 1 and the magnitude of this is 1 so we can just ignore those parts when we find the magnitude and it's just this part right here so we're given then that the magnitude of z is just given by the um, Pythagoras theorem again so a1 squared plus b1 squared divided by a2 squared plus b2 squared and take the square root of the whole thing for the phase the phase of z will be the phase of z1 minus the phase of z2. Why is that the case? Because um, so this phase relationship is true because we can see if we just rewrite, just carry on this part, we see this is actually given by the magnitude of z1 over z2 times e to the j z1 um, minus j phase of z2 because we're uh, taking the exponential and dividing the two together which means we subtract their exponents. Well the phase of this part is zero so we can ig ignore this part and the phase of this part is the phase of z1 minus z2 because we can just rewrite that as j z1 minus z2 in brackets. So we have then that the phase of this complex number, the ratio of two complex numbers, is given by the phase of the numerator and subtract the phase of the denominator. So we can um, then write that out as the arctan of b1 over a1 minus the arctan of b2 over a2, assuming both a1 and a2 are greater than 0. So next we want to revisit Ohm's law, but when we have our Laplace transform or in the um, frequency domain, look at our capacitor and inductors in particular. So we want to look at Ohm's law. Now we'll look at it as an impedance as opposed to a just a simple resistance. So we have that given an element here which has impedance z, i is equal to v divided by z. So i equals v over z in this case. Now if um, z happens to be, if we're looking at a resistor, then z is just equal to r. So there's no complex values here in this case. If Z happens to be a capacitor of size C, then Z is equal to 1 over SC. Finally, if um, Z happens to be an inductor, then we write Z is equal to S times L. In all cases here, the S is the Laplace transform variable that we've discussed already. So once again, we let S equal J omega to evaluate what happens at a frequency omega. So the question might be, why is there this complex value J in here? Why does this occur in our electrical circuits, in particular with capacitors and inductors? So the reason way we can see this is let's look at a capacitor. So if we have a capacitor with a um, value C and we apply a current I sub S onto this capacitor, then we know that uh, the, the current through the capacitor is equal to um, I sub S because there's a current source driving this capacitor. And we, let's assume that I sub S is a sine wave. So we have a sine of omega T of value A sub P. So it has a peak value A sub P. Then we look at the output 
actually this is our in, input first. So this is uh, our input, which is the capacitance uh, current. So we'll see that the capacitor current is just equal to our input, which is given by this curve here. And let's say, so let's say we go into a laboratory and we do this measurement. In this particular case, we let the uh, peak value be one milliamp. So the peak current is one milliamp. We let the frequency of our sine wave be one kilohertz, which is omega equal to 6.28 times uh, 10 to the third uh, radians per second. And so that means our period of our sine wave is one millisecond. So we go into our lab and we look at the voltage across this capacitor. So we measure V sub C across the capacitor. And what we find is the V sub C is 90 degrees out of phase with the current. So we see that we have a 90 degrees um, phase difference between our capacitor voltage and our current which gives us an indication of why we need our J, because that gives us a 90 degrees phase difference. But let's look at our math here and see if our math works out as well then. So we have, in this case, our um, current source I sub S, and creating uh, a current I sub C into the capacitor, and, create, and looking at the voltage V sub C here. And we recall that um, I is equal to V divided by Z, just Ohm's law. So we can say the transfer function for this particular case, because we're looking at the output, we're looking at the output voltage relative to the input, um, well, relative to the capacitor current. And we um, can then say that we have I sub C, I, the current through the capacitor, again, using this equation here, I and I is equal to V, which is the capacitor on the voltage, divided by Z, and Z we've said is equal to for a capacitor one over SC. So we have our transfer function, which we said is um, V sub C over I sub S. We divide uh, both sides on this by V sub C. We see that the transfer function is just equal to one over SC. So in other words, the transfer function for the uh, a current across the capacitor to the voltage across of the capacitor, the current into a capacitor relative to the voltage across the capacitor is just one over SC. So if we look at the magnitude response, what we'd find is that the magnitude response of T of J omega is one over J omega C because we let S equal J omega. If we look at the magnitude, the J term here, has a magnitude of one. So this just has a magnitude of one for J, so we can uh, pretty much ignore that for magnitude response. And we just have that the magnitude response is just one over omega C. So then we look at the phase response. And remember this is by analysis. We have the phase of T of J omega C, so the phase of this, is equal to the phase of one over J omega C. So how do we find the phase of that? It's a complex number over a complex number. So it's the phase of the numerator, one, which is here, subtract the phase of the denominator, which is here. That, the phase of the denominator is 90 degrees. The phase of the numerator is zero degrees. So it's zero minus 90. So the phase difference between uh, or the phase of this trans function is always minus 90, which is what we measure in the lab. So we can see why we needed that J term in here in order for everything to work out correctly. So if we went into the lab and we measured the voltage across this capacitor, we'd see an output that would look something like this. And we can see this has been shifted um, actually shifted to the left by 90 degrees. So this has been shifted by 90 degrees, which is what we expected. 
And we'd also find a potentially new amplitude, and the amplitude actually turns out to be given by AP divided by omega C. How does that amplitude work out? So AP, if you recall, is the peak current through the capacitor. And so divide by omega C, so it depends upon the capacitance value and the uh, frequency. So if we had a capacitance that happened to be one uh, microfarad, and our peak amplitude was one milliamp, which we decided at the beginning, then we'd find that the peak voltage in this case, so the peak voltage, a sub p over omega c, would equal this. And you put in omega, which is given by 6.28 times 10 to the third, c, which is one microfarad, put that all together and you'd find a value of 0 0.15 volts. Where did we get this term AP over omega C? Well, that's because we have this transfer function is given by one of S C. So we have that uh, VC of S is equal to IC of S divided by SC. And that's where we got our, uh, because of the peak current through omega C, that showed up as AP. So next, I want to look at the transfer function of linear time invariant systems in more detail. In this frequency um, response section, we're going to be restricting ourselves always to real valued impulse responses. So in other words, it's a real valued system. If we have a real input, our output is also real, and we're not dealing with complex inputs and complex outputs. Those do occur in many wireless systems, but we're not going to deal with that in this uh, section. We're also going to be assuming that all our circuits are created with lumped elements. As I mentioned before, if that's the case, then we'll always have a ratio of a polynomial to another polynomial. So that's the only case we'll be dealing with as well on these nodes. Now we can write our transfer function in two main methods. And this is section, this is number two here. We can write it either as a ratio of polynomials and written in polynomial form. So in this case, it's a sub naught plus a1s plus a2s squared plus, and so on, a sub m s to the m. And we divide this by 1 plus uh, b1s plus b2s squared plus, and so on, plus bn s to the n. And if you notice, um, we've not put b0 here. We don't need that because we can always divide the top and the bottom by B0 and force this equal to 1, and we haven't lost any generality at all. So this can make a general ratio of two polynomials. So this is one way, and this is called polynomial form. So we call this one polynomial form. We can also write this in what's called root form. So we can write it in root form. And that's where now we'll take um, T of S is equal to A sub M divided by B sub N. So it's the largest uh, coefficient for the numerator on the, in terms of the S to the M, where M is the largest uh, uh, exponent for the S, and divided by B sub N, where S to the N, where N is the largest number for the S in the denominator. And then we can write it as s plus z1 times s plus z2, and so on, where um, each of these z's are the zeros of the polynomial. In other words, it's where the numerator will go to zero. So the numerator uh, will always go to zero at s equal to z1. If s equals z1, then this whole term will go to zero so the numerator goes to zero. And similarly, if s equals z2, then this term will go to zero, so the whole numerator will go to zero. So we call these all the zeros of, uh, the, of the transfer function. But the roots for the denominator, if s equals omega one, sorry, s equal to, uh, I said that a little wrong, I should have been saying that s goes to minus uh, zi. So when s is equal to minus z1, then this goes to zero, or s equals minus z2, then this goes to zero. For the root form, sorry, for the uh, denominator, 
whenever s goes to minus omega i, or in this case s goes to minus omega 1, then the denominator goes to 0, so the transfer function goes to infinity. So we refer to these parts as the poles of the system, not the zeros of the trans function, but the poles of the trans function. So whenever s equals minus omega sub i, um, and uh, omega i uh, is one of the um, uh, poles, then we'll see that this um, trans function will go to infinity. So in general, you can always write a, any polynomial in either root form or in polynomial form. So if you go into MATLAB, you can write, look at MATLAB and you'll see that you can write a polynomial in either polynomial form or you can write it in root form. In general, uh, all the zeros and the poles are complex values and could occur, would always occur in complex conjugate pole pairs. So they're always complex conjugate pairs if our transfer function is a real transfer function. So that will always be the case. Um, if it's on the real axis, then it doesn't need to be a complex conjugate pair because it's just on the real axis, so it has no complex conjugate pair in that case. Now, for this frequency analysis part for uh, circuits, we'll only be dealing with all of the zi's, so all of the zeros and all the poles being real valued, so on the real axis. We'll see that when we go to the freq or when we go to a feedback section, that we can then create poles and zeros which are not on the real axis. But if everything, if there's no feedback in our system, then you'll we'll find that all of our poles and all our zeros will be on the real axis. So for this frequency analysis section, we'll be just dealing with real valued poles and zeros. And this just explains that again. We'll be dealing with all our poles and zeros on the real axis. Now we also know that for a stable system, all of our poles have to be in the negative half plane. Um, in this case, it would have to be on the negative real axis because they're all um, on the real axis. And that's to guarantee stability of a system. So as I mentioned above, zeros are where t of s equals zero. So a zero at s equals z1 means that t of z1 will equal zero. Poles are where t of s goes to infinity. So a pole at s equal omega sub i means that t of omega i will go to infinity. So here are some examples of some trans functions. First case, t of s is equal to 1 divided by s plus 2. So this has no zeros because the numerator is just equal to 1. So it has no zeros. t of s never goes to 0. But it has a pole at omega 1 equal to minus 2 because if s is equal to minus 2, not j, um, minus 2, but just minus 2. So if s is equal to minus 2, then t of s will go to infinity. So there's no j in this part. Though, remember, we're letting s equal j omega in order to look at physical frequencies, what happens for a sinusoidal wave. But right now we're just talking about when the trans function goes to 0 or to infinity. Um, and so we can let s be whatever we want. And in this case, we let s equal um, minus 2 and this to infinity. The next example we have s divided by s plus 3. So this would have a 0 at z equal to 0 because if s for the numerator, if s goes to 0, then the t of s will go to 0. For the denominator, we have a pole at uh, omega 1 equal to minus 3 because if s goes to minus 3, uh, t of s goes to infinity. And finally, we have another third example here, and this will have a 0 at s equal to 0, and also a 0 at s equal to 2, and then it has a pole at minus 1 and a pole at minus 3.
So this will still be stable because our poles are all in the negative real axis. So all of these functions were uh, stable. So once again, we have T of S in root form shown here. And we're saying all our poles are at minus omega i and all our zeros are at minus z sub i. Now, in the case we have real axis poles and zeros, which is the case we're dealing with here, we have a terminology that gets used quite a bit. We often say that the pole frequency is at omega i, or the zero frequency is at z i, even though it's actually occurring. So we would say when we have a pole at minus omega i, we would say the pole frequency is at omega i. So in other words, if omega i was equal to um, 1,000 radians per second, we'd have a pole, strictly speaking, at minus 1,000 radians per second. But we would often say that we have a pole frequency at 1,000 radians per second. Now, why do we say this? The reason we say this, because if we only consider that pole at omega i, then t of s becomes reduced by 1 over root 2 at t of j omega i. So in other words, in this example here, 1 over s plus 1 at uh, dc, so when s equals 0, this is a gain of 1. If we let s go to infinity, if we let s go to infinity, so uh, let s equal j infinity, then uh, the magnitude will be uh, 0, or t of j omega j infinity will be 0. But if we let, um, I should be showing a magnitude response on these, this should be the magnitude response, magnitude response and the magnitude response. If we let uh, s equal j1, then the magnitude response will be 1 over root 2. So we reduced our gain by root 2 from 1. So we've gone down by 3 dB. So in other words, if we plotted this case here, we would get a curve that would look something like this. And um, at the value of 1 radian per second, the drop here is 3 dB. So we have a 3 dB attenuation at 1 radian per second. So our pole is actually at minus 1 on the um, real axis, but we say it has a pole frequency of 1 radian per second. And we can do the same thing with the 0. So the 0 will increase by a, a root 2, whereas the pole the attenuation drops by root 2. So here's an example of uh, having a zero and a pole. So in this case here, um, if we let uh, s equal zero, so t of zero, we see that um, we would ignore both these terms and we just have two over 100. So the gain would just be 0 0.02. And again, this should be the um, magnitude response. And t of j infinity, of j infinity, if s goes to infinity, so if this, if this term here goes to infinity, and this term here also goes to infinity, j infinity, then we'd have j infinity divided by j infinity, we could ignore these two terms, and the gain would be 1 at high frequencies. So we get this value here. So we can plot that curve and we would see a curve that looks something like this. And we'd see that at our zero frequency of um, t equal to j2, that it would be root 2 times higher than 
our magnitude at t uh, of um, t of zero or the dc value. So we have a 3 dB increase in our, at our zero, right at this location here. And if we looked at our pole at 100 radians per second, we'd see it be root two times smaller than our high frequency attenuation. So we have a 3 dB decrease for our pole here. So that's why we tend to say in this circuit, we have a zero frequency of two radians per second and a pole frequency of 100 radians per second. So as I mentioned, we would be saying this, two terms here, a zero at two radians per second and a pole at 100 radians per second. So I want to end this um, discussion of the transfer function by looking at an alternative way to write the um, root form for the transfer function. So we've already already seen this approach where we write it as s plus z1 times s plus z2 and so on to s plus zm and similarly for the denominator and it's multiplied by these coefficients over here a sub m uh, divided by b sub m. So this is the one we've already seen. So if I want to know what the gain is at infinite frequency, all of the terms here uh, dominate. So the S dominates in all these terms, and similarly down here. So what we see is that we no longer have to worry about Z1, Z2, and all those terms. So what we see is that for S going to J infinity, the gain of this will be A sub N over b sub n if m equals n. So if the uh, order of the two polynomials is the same for the numerator and denominator, so m is equal to n, then the high frequency gain will be given by just this term here, a sub m divided by b sub m, n. And, um, but if m is less than n, then we'll have more S terms on the denominator than we will on the, on the numerator, and the high frequency gain will just be zero. So, but now if we want to know the DC gain of this transfer, transfer curve, and we say, what is the DC gain for um, the way we write it here? What would be the DC gain? We'll let S equal to zero, and then we find this complicated equation to find the DC gain. So the DC gain is not very apparent the way we've written it here. So an alternative way to write this is to write the transfer function shown in this way, where we explicitly show the DC gain, so we find out what the DC gain is, and then we have a one, 1 plus s over z1 times 1 plus s over z2 uh, times 1 plus s over z sub m, and so on. And the denominator is 1 plus s over omega 1 times 1 uh, plus s over omega 2, and so on. And if we do that, the high frequency gain is not obvious. So if I want, if, if m is less than n, I should, should uh, clarify this, if m is less than n, then it's zero as before. It's easy to find. But in the case that uh, m is equal to n, it becomes complicated. So it's not a very good way to show the high frequency gain. But what's nice about here is the gain at DC, we just let s go to zero here, 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 and so on. So all of the numerator goes to one, the denominator goes to one, and the DC gain is just this value right here. So it just becomes k sub DC. So we have the DC gain is easily found. So we find that this alternative approach gets used quite a bit, particularly for low-pass responses, and which is often the case that we're interested in. So that ends this review, and I'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.